thought I would do is start first with my influences, and then I would talk about the paintings, and then after that, if anybody had any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. But I'd like to start, um, and I think that, that this, even if you're not an art major, we all, I want to think we all like beautiful things. So uh, this is something I wrote about uh, beauty uh, and about art. We approach art either as appreciators or as creators. As appreciators, we have to be able to relate to what we're seeing. As creators, we have to be able to create something that in some way connects with other people. Uh, what's the common denominator between these two groups? I believe it's a desire to be moved by beauty. Art gives us that unique opportunity to touch and be touched by beauty. And it's my belief that unless something has happened to our life to change us, we're naturally attracted to beauty. Uh, we want to be moved by it. And there's a very deep part of us that was, in fact, created by God himself to connect with it. In her book, Venus in Exile, The Rejection of Beauty in the 20th Century Art, Wendy Steiner underlines the assertion that modern art is purposely ugly and attempts to trace the intellectual roots of this monstrosity through the philosophies of Immanuel Kant and Edmund Burke, early 20th century philosophers. And they argued for the avant-garde in the movement to banish the feminine, the sentimental, and the beautiful in striving to attain the shattering experience of the sublime. If you've got any art history courses, you may be familiar with that, that term, the sublime. Steiner's thesis throughout is that the result has been a double dehumanizing and severe alienation of human interest. Steiner also said that it takes social courage to have taste now. You have to be willing to go your own way. I believe that you have to define your own narrative. Popular appeal cannot be a motivation. Seeking it could cause you to invalidate yourself. Through beauty, the creator can touch and move, and if you will, bless the viewer. To me, this is the one of the most noble purposes of art. So I have, uh, I uploaded a PDF to my website. I noticed that you didn't have a projector here. So um, if you want to go, anybody's got a smartphone, if you want to go to Grogan. That's S-H-E-I-L-A-H-G-R-O-G-A-N dot com. I have some, um, I have, you know, this could be an interactive talk. You could, uh, I assume you have Wi-Fi here. I don't see too many people uh, looking for their phones, but it would kind of maybe help you appreciate this more and enjoy it more and get more out of it. If you did, I did. I do have this on a um, iPad, but this is awfully small for folks in the back. So, has anybody got the website up yet? Uh, if you go to the menu on the right of the website, uh, the last uh, menu item is influences, and if you click on that, you'll be able to to get this PDF. So, while you're waiting, I could do a little tap dance, but I don't think. So, <laughs> is anybody there yet? Can you spell it again? Yeah, can okay, you um, it's all one word. It's S H E I L A H G R O G A N <laughs> dot com. Thank you. First name Sheila, last name Grogan, all smushed together <laughs> dot com. And the very last menu item is influences, and that's where you'll find a link to this PDF. Anybody not have a phone? I have a printed one printed copy. The Wi-Fi being a problem? It's real slow. Okay, it'll take a minute. That's okay. Okay, while we're waiting for that, uh, the first part of the PDF is I do have a statement, and I'll just go ahead and read that. Uh, this is a statement, uh, a quote by Dick Wittenborn, and he wrote a book called Fierce People. 
And he says, we are the sum of all the people we have ever met. You change the tribe and the tribe changes you. And so um, in just kind of um, dovetailing off of that, um, my statement is um, that maybe his uh, thinking is just a little bit too sweeping, but at least in part it's true, I think as an artist, you are influenced by everything you see. And, and then in turn, people that see your work will take something away and they might unconsciously be influenced by it. But of all the artists that were influencing me, uh, whether I saw them in a classroom as a young kid or at a museum or in a gallery, there was something about it that I identified with. And so I've got a collection of these artists here in this PDF. And then I've also included a quote because it's not just their pictures that influenced me. A lot of it was about their grit. Some of these guys never sold a painting. Some of these guys, nobody respected their work when they were alive. And so um, you got to admire that, that they, they were true to themselves and they kept doing what was important to them to do, even though they weren't getting any strokes from anybody. They weren't getting any positive feedback. They had the guts to just do it and to be true to themselves. So does anybody have uh, the PDF up yet? Okay. Well, the first one that I have is Georgia O'Keeffe. She does these, um, let's see if this will flip, nope. She does these, she's known for her sweeping um, flowers where you're, you're like right up against the flower. And uh, I always thought about Georgia O'Keeffe as like, she looks at the usual in an unusual way. And so for me that was like, that must be what art is about. You're taking something as average as a flower and you're making us look at that in a way that I never in real life ever look at a flower like that. And so uh, that caught my attention. And then um, this is a, this is the inside of a flower and she's, I think this is a watercolor, but it's unrecognizable. So that intrigued me that, that she took that further, she pushed that further, taking something so common and making it foreign. And I have, the next guy is Giorgio Morandi. He was a guy from Italy, he never <coughs> left his village. All this man did was paint. And he took basic objects like little jars and little cups and painted them. And all you notice about these paintings is the paint strokes. It's like icing on a cake, it's so pretty. And these shapes against this background other people would just ignore this, but he has done like an investigation of it. And the way he treats the objects, the way he lovingly looks at it and makes you appreciate it is completely fascinating to me. The third artist I've got here is Wayne Tebow. Has anybody ever heard of Wayne Tebow? <laughs> There's my tribe back. <laughs> Wayne Tebow, I got to study with him at Kent State University. And he was always called a pop artist, but he really wasn't part of the pop movement. He was, when he was young, he was in advertising. And he would make Mickey Mouses and Minnie Mouses and hot dogs and cakes and pies and stuff for advertising. And that's not what he really wanted to do. So he kind of took a leap and he went into the art field later in life and he was a massive success. And he, like Giorgio Morandi, his painting textures are, it, when he has a pie up here, you look at it and say, I'm hungry, I want to eat that. It's so delicious looking. And um, he takes unusual common objects and makes them unusual by the way he treats them. Here's a quote from Wayne Tebow. He says, common objects become strangely uncommon when removed from their context and ordinary ways of seeing. Right now, the guy is 90 years old and he's still painting. And he's doing these landscapes of San Francisco that look like a roller coaster ride. I don't know if you can see this one. It's like utterly fascinating. That's a mountaintop and look at the clouds. Here's another quote that uh, really resonates with me. He says, I'm not just interested in the pictorial aspects of the landscape. See a pretty place and try and paint it. But in some way to manage it, to manipulate it, or see what I can turn it into. And boy, I think that's what I've tried to do. I'm not just trying to paint a pretty picture of fish uh, in a lake. Uh, I want to make some type of narrative that makes you say, huh? 
I mean, that's what's interesting to me. So I've got uh, birds acting in an unusual way here. Who ever heard of such a thing? That cracks me up. I want to paint paintings that people either laugh at or say, I never thought of looking at it that way. And Wayne Tebow is one of my, um, my major inspirations. Then another artist, the next one, is Maxfield Parrish. And he, very, his, he was also in advertising, but when he went into fine art, very unpopular. Never, uh, never got too many uh, pats on the back for his work. He would do these landscapes with these really huge rolling clouds and everything. And he influenced me in, in this painting, The Bee Thief. Um, I started with the clouds in that thing. Then I saw a little picture of a cat walking down a path, and I thought, hmm, that'd be fun. And then I thought it was cute, but it was just like, okay, that's a cat walking down a path. So what? So I thought it would be funny to put a bee in its mouth and make it like this little kitty was a big game hunter. And I kind of have to be engaged, and I kind of have to be getting a kick out of it in order to put the hours in to do something that's that tedious. And so that concept cracked me up, and so that's what kept me going on that painting. Um, here's what Max Field Parish said. The hard part is how to plan a picture so as to give to others what has happened to you, <coughs> to render and paint an experience, to suggest the sense of light and color of air and space. That's what I want to do. I want to give an experience with my work. Um, so you're not just coming in to look at a picture of some flowers. You're looking at that and you're saying, what, what is going on here? So hopefully I, I'm successful at that. The next artist is Mark Chagall. I think he's the first artist I ever liked when I was in high school. He, um, has anybody ever seen the movie uh, Fiddler on the Roof? Are you familiar with that? Well, I always thought maybe it was based on this guy's work because he did a lot of paintings of fiddlers on roofs of his little Russian village. He was Jewish, and in Russia, if you were a Jew, you couldn't get a job, uh, you couldn't go into a profession, you were kind of uh, scum of the earth. And so um, he, he had an uphill battle to be what he was. Yellow. <laughs> Sorry. That's OK. Tell him that we're not here. And let's see what he said. Oh, yeah. This, I love this. He said, only love interests me, and I'm only in contact with things that revolve around love. That takes guts. Do not to put up with, excuse my French, crap in your life, but to just say, if this isn't meaningful to me, if this isn't about love, I just don't want any part of it. So that, this is a painting of his wife, Bella. And he was crazy about that lady. Here's a, a little small inset, a picture of him while he's actually making the painting. The next artist, another person who fought against the machine, was Marie Lawrenson. She was a cubist. She's one of the few women who were allowed to be in the cubist. And her paintings don't look anything like Picasso's. They're just, they're completely, she completely stayed true to herself. In fact, she said, why should I paint dead fish, onions, and beer glasses? Girls are so much prettier. So she was true to herself, even though she was going against the grain of her time. And the next artist, how many people have heard of Henry Matisse? Any, anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Anybody? <laughs> OK. He was kind of, he was kind of an iconoclast. Anybody know what that means? Uh, image smasher? Uh, he just like, he tore it up. Um, people freaked out over his paintings. They were called fobs, which mean wild beast. And they were not allowed to exhibit in the, uh, the big fancy exhibits every year in Paris because they weren't playing by the rules. I love that about his work. He said, I've always tried to hide my efforts, and I wish my works to have a light joyousness of springtime, which never lets anyone suspect the labor it has cost me. So he's trying to create an experience for you, and he doesn't want you to know how much blood, sweat, and tears went into it. I love that. Now, the next artist is probably one of the greatest female artists of the 20th century. Her name was Helen Frankenthaler. 
And has anybody ever heard of abstract expressionism? Yeah, or color field painting? She was one of the few original abstract expressionists, and she was just amazing. She didn't care if she was a woman. She didn't care if people didn't like what she did. She just was going to be herself. Um, I love it when she said, I'd rather risk an ugly surprise than rely on things I know I can do. Yeah, she could paint pretty horses and pretty houses, but she was going and aiming for something where she didn't know all the answers. You gotta respect that. Then I have several uh, images of hers of these color field paintings, and they really, this little tiny scale does not do them justice. They are, and probably some of them, I've seen them in museums, they're as big as this wall. They're overwhelming, and this little lady did them. She said, you have to know how to use the accident, how to recognize it, how to control it, and ways to eliminate it so that the whole surface looks felt and born all at once. Like if, I, um, if I'm showing you a picture, I want you to think that it always was that way, that this finished product is so tightly put together that it couldn't have been any other way. And I think that's what she was talking about out there. <laughs> Excuse me. There's something else I was going to say about Frankenthaler that, um, oh, this is totally for nothing, but she was married to a, fa a famous painter named Robert Motherwell, and they wound up getting divorced. And I read in a book one time called The Artist in Society how it's really not good for artists to be married to each other because they're going to compete and one is going to dominate and the other one is going to resent it and their marriage did fall apart. In fact, I was doing a cookbook for artists and as a fundraiser and I called Robert Motherwell and asked him if he had a recipe to be put in this cookbook and I said, um, how is Helen? Uh, because my, my husband uh, was a student of Helen Frankenthaler's at the University of Pennsylvania and I said, so how is your wife? How's Helen? He said, she left me this week. I said, oh, well, listen, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> but it was like, oh, you know, kill me now. It was really awkward. But anyway, Helen didn't stay with Robert. Uh, the next artist is an American artist named Cy Twombly. And he also did these mammoth canvases and you may have seen him, and I always feel like it's Cy Twombly's work that they say when they say, my kid could do that. Because he very often, this is an image of a normal sized person in a gallery with one of his works, and you see the scale of that. It's ridiculous. It's humongous. Um, he said, I never really separated painting from literature. And talk about going against the grain. He was true to himself regardless this is what was inside of him, this is what he wanted to express, and he did. Some of them are very pretty. The next artist is David Hockney. Anybody here ever hear of David Hockney? He's still, <laughs> I got two faithful people back there. Um, he's still living, and he uh, lived in California for a long time, but he's actually English, and now he lives over in England, and he does these mammoth landscapes of where he was born and raised, Yorkshire. And these are um, canvases that he puts all together. So this gives you an idea of the scale of this guy's work. I get sometimes kind of antsy working on this scale and saying, I hope it doesn't get away from me. And look at the size of this stuff. It's just, there's the guy right there in the <laughs> canvas. So. This doesn't have a zoom. Um, there's a really neat movie about Hockney. It's called The Bigger Picture. And it talks about um, how he. Did you have a question? No question. Um, stretching is allowed. Um, it talks about, you know, the process for him, and he's really an, kind of an adorable person. He's a little bit quaint, he's a little eccentric, but a lot of artists are. He said, looking at nature has now become an addiction. 
I'm very touched by what Van Gogh said. He lost his father's faith, but he found another in the infinity of nature. And that is true. Uh, I started getting involved in painting nature paintings when I um, started, um, when I took up running. And we, up in Toledo, we got a lot of really excellent metro parks. And I would do a lot of running, and I would sometimes I'd just stop in my tracks and, and say, hey, this is really beautiful. And it's, I'm sort of enclosed in it. And then I read Emerson's essay on nature, and that made me feel uh, about nature that was like, it was kind of like a religious experience. Um, so if you ever want to, if you're feeling detached from nature and like, yeah, well, so what? Ants, mosquitoes, no thanks. Read Emerson's essay on nature, and it'll give you a new perspective. And then there's a famous uh, British painter from the 1700s named John Constable, and he would just do these oil sketches of skies that were just to die for. In fact, when it's a really pretty day out, I just say, there's a John Constable sky. He said, when I sit down to make a sketch from nature, the first thing I try to do is forget that I've ever seen a picture. And I think that, too, is about being true to yourself and not trying to copy somebody else's work. You can get in a trap by trying to copy somebody else's work if you're not careful. Sometimes it's good to do it. Like, sometimes I like to go to a museum and sit down and just sketch and just imitate, um, like, the sculptures or the, the paintings. But, but other times, it's not good to do that. <coughs> Um, and then we have Pierre Bonnard. He was uh, also kind of another eccentric guy. He was part of the post-impressionists, um, and he never got around much, just did paintings of his wife and his cat. But the thing about Bonnard is the way he used color. He would take a warm color, uh, say like, like red, and he would have that be like a low-value red, and then it, he would put it right next to a high value green so that the color would kind of vibrate and so his paintings have this 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 uh, crystalline quality to them if you've ever seen one in person it's uh, it's quite an experience it's quite different then uh, I'm influenced by William Merritt Chase another 20th century American he was uh, known as being a teacher and he would he taught some of the greats of American art love his skies. Winslow Homer, who doesn't know who Winslow Homer is? Let's go that way. Anybody does not know? Okay, look him up, Google him. He, um, he did these heroic pictures of the, uh, fishermen battling the sea and man against nature. And the thing is, is that he did a lot of them in watercolor. And has anybody here tried to do watercolor? Watercolor beats my tail feathers every time. Oil painting, I can do, but watercolor, it wins. I lose. It's tough, but he does these, these intricate, detailed, powerful images with watercolor. He said, I regret very much I have painted a picture that requires a description. <laughs> he just, he, uh, he was an outsider on that score, too. Then I have Vincent Van Gogh who, um, talk, talk about an outsider, he was the ultimate outsider. His mother lost a baby the year before he was born. So his whole family had, um, that was under a cloud of depression. And that depression never left him all his life, and he was mentally ill. And he struggled, but he made beautiful things in spite of his suffering. And I respect that so much. He, I have a quote here about him where he talks about Christ being the ultimate artist, how he wasn't, uh, he didn't work with paint, he didn't work with uh, marble, he worked with human beings, and he made immortal souls, and I thought that was very touching. Um, I'm, I'm including uh, J.E.H. MacDonald. He is a painter from the Canadian Seven, if you've ever heard of that group. Um, they, they're very, they were influenced by Japanese prints, if you would like to Google those guys, they're very interesting. When I, I taught um, high school art for X number of years, and then I took early retirement, and I went back, <clears throat> and I went to school with guys your age. And that was probably the neatest experience of my life. 
and one of our professors said, make it a habit to look at artists. Go on the internet and look at artists every day, you know, to get visually literate. And I did, and I discovered these Canadian Seven. I never would have known about it. How are we doing on time? 25 minutes. 22? 15 till. 15 till, okay. So um, one of these guys, uh, uh, J.E.H. McDonald, said, to paint from nature is to realize one's sensations, not to copy what is before you. Then I have Julie Heffernan. She lives today. She does all of these. I'm different from her. I'm, I don't care about social commentary, but she's like really an activist, and if she cares about something, she paints, and her painting is a statement about it, and she, but she always makes every painting like a self-portrait. So she's in every single painting. Then John Wilby, he is a surrealist from Wisconsin. He's amazing. Deborah Morrissey McGough, which I think Professor Neal might know. She, you might know her. She, I think, had an exhibit here. Mm -hmm. She's a Cincinnati area artist. I'm very influenced by her. She is, uh, she's amazing. And then the last one I have is Elizabeth Shreve. She just paints these wacky paintings of herself baking pies and floating in the sky and birds that are bigger than her head and everything, and I love that. So I think art sometimes is so serious and so like a religious experience, and you have to keep your voice down like you're in a library when you're in a museum. But I think art should be fun. I can't be in a field and not be myself. And so I think um, these paintings are, are outcroppings of my imagination and my sense of humor, and I, I hope that you've, you've seen that. And I'd like to talk about any of these individual works here. If anybody has any questions, maybe we can, we can go into that. Um, let me just, uh, let me pick on somebody. Uh, how many people have seen this exhibit before today? Okay, can I pick on you? Sure. What would be your favorite one? Um, the one with the koi fish. Ah, so what, what is it about that that appeals to you? The fact that the uh, birds are acting in ways that birds don't act, or just the fact that there's some tension there? Mm -hmm. uh, I like the view of it, how it looks kind of circular. Okay, well let me share something about that. I've incorporated a flaw of mine in my pictures. I have trouble with perspective. I always have. My, I would sweat bullets when I would have to teach perspective to high school kids because I'm so bad at it. And so my paintings, if you may have noticed, the perspective is all wonky. So I have just kind of harnessed a flaw and just I'm just going to ride that pony until we're finished. <laughs> so I can't help it uh, that I'm not good at that. So I'm just going to make it like it was on purpose. OK. Um, did it? Yeah, you got a question? Riding off the depth or the, uh, what, what did you call it again? What are you, what are you bad at? I'm bad at perspective. <laughs> yeah. You look like you did really good in the one to You look like you got, some, got some depth with the mountains. But look at this. Here's the earth, oh, the right? Bird is, is, yeah, what <laughs> bird is as big as a, a, mountain, a yeah. field? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's just completely yeah. nuts. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> yeah. Go so, ahead. Like, like, learning about like the monkey and how he like like would study like anatomy yes. first and like go from like, the bones to the vein and like, do art from the inside out. Yes. You said you went to like art to the run. You would see birds, you would see nature. Mm -hmm. So as deep as Da Vinci goes with like, like drawing the skeleton of the dog. And yes. From there, mm -hmm. the shore is more of just like on the outer layer, just of what you see. Yeah, and more like a mood. Yeah. Like an impression. Like uh, I am like trying to capture the fanciful playfulness yeah. that, that the way nature impacts me. Um, you know, interesting about Da Vinci, Gino in his whole lifetime as an adult, he only wore pink and purple clothing. That's, um, that's a little whack. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also, it was against the law for him to, um, to do these autopsies, but he would go out at, at night when everybody was asleep and he would, he would just snatch like homeless people that had died on the road 
Yeah. You just bring them back to the studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have friends who are like interested in that, and they'll like bring dead bird carcasses right. back in the That's studio, good. and I'm like, <laughs> you know, yeah. kill me now. I can't believe you can do that. Yeah. But see, you know, we see we're all different. You right. just have to be what drives you. Because I don't want to see some piece of art that you did where you were trying to look like your friend who really can nail drawing trains. How is that going to be authentic? It's just not. So, yeah, that, thanks for sharing that. Anybody else got any uh, questions? Or can I get another volunteer to tell me one of the paintings they like? And yes? Um, I really like this one. Like, this, this one right here? Right. Oh, the bird, the bee thief? I really like that. Like, I love the clouds on it. Like, like that's, the, that's the one where I started with the clouds because I was trying to copy a Maxfield Parish painting. And I was just like, and I had done, I tried to actually make it real realistic. The, um, the area where the flowers are, it was just like earth tones and dark greens and everything, and I thought, wow, I suck at being Maxfield Parish. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just saw this picture, like I shared earlier, of a little cat walking down a green uh, path. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just throw a cat in there. And then it was just like, okay, now we got a Maxfield Parish painting with a kitty cat. That sucks too. And, you know, so, so the process is, is like you're trying to just find your way and just... Um, I'll take um, uh, coffee with light cream. <laughs> so anyway, uh, hey, thanks for coming, you guys. Okay. Now, how many? Okay. So, how much more time do I have? Okay. But I don't want to. I don't want to keep people here if they, you know, if they felt like they've seen what they wanted to see and it's. Yeah. Anybody else want to? If you want to move up. Or if you have any other questions, hey, you're saving me here. What's your name? My name. Is yeah. Corey. Corey. Yeah. Corey, you're saving I me see, here. Yeah. You're getting. You're making. You're helping me make this interactive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're an art major, I take it. I'm a history major. Oh, are you? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a history major, and like I told the woman back there, like I'm also right brain thinking, so very creative. Yeah. So like. I'm right brain too. I can't find my socks, right. but I can think of paintings to do. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. uh, when I think of art, you know, Da Vinci or uh, mm -hmm. you know Michelangelo. Yeah. I, I like the technical side, but then I come in here and it's like throw that out the window. Yeah. I get all the functionalist stuff. But you know what? Like it, as students, and I think this is true in any field, you have to learn the rules so that you can throw the rules away. Yeah. But, because, but if you don't know the rules, you don't know how to jigger them and make them work for you and know which rules to really rely on. Like, I am not good at the rule of perspective. But I had to learn, like, color theory, and uh, I had to learn uh, composition, and I had to learn um, how, you know, how to have my paintings flow and have some dy dynamic movement in my paintings. And that kind of my, uh, that those can be crutches for me to compensate for the fact that my perspective is a problem for me. Mm -hmm. I was very, very bad at drawing, and I, uh, I took drawing one about six times. Yeah. And I just kept going back and getting different professors so that I could, because I, I couldn't tolerate being bad at something that was so interesting to me. Yeah. And you do what you have to do. If I, I know so many people that are so much better artists than me, um, I can't really hold a candle to them. But I'm more motivated than they are. So a lot of times it isn't really even about talent, it's about motivation and also having something to say. Somebody, did anybody want to ask me about like any of the symbolism in the work? Um, some, when we had the opening, some students um, Professor Neal made them ask me questions, <laughs> and they a lot of them asked what the symbolism of the birds was, and I didn't even really know. I just thought, hey, birds are cool, and so um, one of my professors said, um, boy, Sheila, um, I really get it about the birds, and I said, great, you do? He said, yeah. 
the birds are you. And I said, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. But then I thought about it, and I thought, it really is, because I had gone through some troubles in my life, and um, I had kind of, if you will, kind of been um, squashed. And so when I, when I got out of that circumstance, and I'm really attracted to painting birds, and birds can fly away. And I thought, yeah, the birds kind of are me. But it was all operating on an unconscious mm -hmm. or subconscious level. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, qu question back there? Since uh, nature, like there's the rules in nature, but you decided that you're taking on your uh, imagination more. Uh, there's no rules, maybe, in, in, in your composition. So how do you know when you're done? Boy, that's a really good question. They should um, like have a big claw that drags ours away <laughs> when it's finished, so they don't wreck it. Um, you know, I have wrecked many a painting, and this is so technical that it's not romantic at all. But I have, you know, you may have like I may have started with say these little birds here. It's like, oh, I nailed it. I love those birds there. But then something else happens in the painting, and now these birds no longer work. And I have to make a decision. And I think it might have been um, William Faulkner who said, or, or maybe it was, um, who's the guy who wrote in Havana? Papa Hemingway. Mm -hmm. It might have been Hemingway uh, that said, you have to, sometimes you have to kill your babies. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if the whole painting takes off and it becomes something else, and these birds don't work anymore. Oh, I gotta kill them. And sometimes I sand off if something isn't working anymore, or if it's been just a horrible mistake, like the color is disgusting, I have to sand it off. In oil paint, you can do that. So I sand it off, regesso it, and repaint it. Um, but my son got me this iPad for Christmas, and now I do my preliminary sketches on an iPad using some really nifty software and I make my mistakes in the software and so I'm not wasting so much time sanding paintings. So that's, that's really nice. But uh, I think, I know when I'm done, when I go away for an hour and I come back and something horrible doesn't jump out at me. And I say, oh, I got to get rid of that. <laughs> and so when I keep going back and then I look at it and nothing jumps out of me, I say, okay, I'm done. Is that your experience, uh, Professor Neil, when you uh, are working on something? Do you, is it anything like that for you? Yeah, I would say that what I have to do sometimes is take my painting and put it away and leave it there for a while and then come back and look at it to see if I get the same kind of reaction. So if it's begging some attention, then I work on it. If not, well, although I think as artists, we're always like, well, well, yeah. well, that little, that thing. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a point where you have to be okay with saying, this is, this is, this, this is going to be it. Wayne yeah. Tebow said that to me when he was my studio critic at Kent State. He said, uh, when you finish a painting, you really ought to put it away for a year. And I thought, I don't have that kind of self-control. <laughs> but it's, it, in principle, it's really true. Yeah. Um, Sheila, I wanted to comment on, on something that you said earlier about this notion of you not under, understanding perspective. Uh -huh. Whereas I think that, partly for me, I enjoy the fact that it's wonky. It, it's, it's wonky, but it's not in your face wonky. It kind of like pulls you in and you discover it. So the, the discovery of it being a little bit weird is kind of interesting to me because that poses questions like why, but I also am really intrigued on how you're bringing the viewer in. I almost feel like in some of these that I'm uh, floating at the level of a participant, mm -hmm. right? So like, um, well, like the one in the back, this one? Right, yeah, I feel like even though there's trees there, I feel like I could be a bird at that, like mm -hmm. it, it kind of pulls mm -hmm. me in that way. The same with these others, others because the viewpoint is really up. It is high. high. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even, um, I imagine with the little cat there on the walk, yeah. um, the dragonflies, I could be an insect. So my placement, where you're pushing the viewer to kind of be, mm -hmm. I do want, I do it. consciously think about, I want the viewer to travel the picture. Yeah. Yeah. I want that to be happening. 
if, uh, if your eye isn't moving around the picture, I consider it a failure, and that's a test I give myself. I, I want my eye to flow. Mm -hmm. And um, the painting there, everything is awesome with the hummingbirds on top, the flowers in the middle, and uh, the koi fish in the bottom. That is purposely uh, done where I didn't apply that principle. I didn't care in that one. I was just having fun. It was, I was coming off of finishing this painting, and I was kind of tired. <laughs> and I wanted to just do something that was just plain fun. And so I, I'm not like intentionally trying to make the viewer, you know, um, move through the painting on that one. Uh, yes. All right, off of that. You can tell, like, for me, I start at the path, mm -hmm. I go down to the water, and then, I, and then I gradually go up and see the birds with the flowers and all, you know what I mean? Yes. And it, that's interesting, and um, I, I kind of wanted that to be happening with the world. With the circle in the middle, yeah. yeah. It like yeah. goes up, and yeah. around. Uh, now, on this one, I, um, I was surprised that it worked without leaves. And originally, um, the title of that painting was Love and Barrenness, and there were no leaves, and there were less birds, and the sky was darker. This was a real dark blue. And um, the painting, it just, uh, it didn't do it for me. I thought, I'm just not going to exhibit this one. And then um, I was playing on the iPad, and I tried a different background, and I thought, well, I will um, I will just lighten the background, and that changed the entire <coughs> painting. Well, I think it, it speaks to, at least from here, the thing that's interesting is the when you're saying the leaves aren't on there and that it works, I feel like the birds are kind of, even though they're there from a distance, it feels like an implied kind of interpretation that they are mm -hmm. uh, leaves on the trees just by the placement and how some of the birds' wings are out. And so, you know, that implied kind of notion yeah. of connecting mm -hmm. dots and yes. putting your own kind your, of... Your eye is yeah. making up for it. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, after... Um, after I changed the background color, then the title didn't work anymore. And then I thought of the title, The Season of Singing Has Come, because obviously birds singing and so forth. And it, at the time, I wasn't aware of it. But later on, I, I was doing some reading, and I realized that the, uh, the, the phrase, The Season of Singing Has Come, is actually in the Song of Psalms in the Bible. And I thought, that's really cool. Mm. So... Um, Yes, and I'm in a point in my life where the season of singing has come. I'm just in a real happy place in my life. I'm doing what I love, and um, the only thing I really miss is I miss teaching because uh, interacting with young people is just, it's very energizing. So, does anybody want to ask me about the dog painting? Because I was going to ask somebody about Jeffrey. Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey is a bad A. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I shouldn't be using cuss words at Thomas More College, but he's a bad actor. <laughs> and um, everybody's scared of him. And there's free puppy rides, and nobody wants to ride with Jeffrey. And can you blame him? Look at that guy. He looks like he has nails and glass for breakfast. <laughs> and then the very back painting, uh, the painting is called The Great Frustration. That's my cat, Krieger, and Krieger was kind of a tough cookie. He, he kind of could take on the world. And my son is a writer, and he wrote a story called The Great Frustration. And it was about uh, a cat in a tree looking at birds that he couldn't get at. And it was a painting that was at the Toledo Museum of Art, and he wrote a story based on it. And so in kind of homage to my son, I did that painting of our family cat, um, kind of terrifying birds and fish. Well, that's, a, that's a really different painting than everything else that you have in here and the way that you've done that. It's very flat and graphic versus... Yes, that's true. It's very, actually, you could say it's quite decorative. Oh, yeah. Well, I have really... I would say, I would love that painting. I would want to decorate my house with that painting. Yeah. Aww. Because it's... it's I like that it's in the middle, too, because it's my favorite. Well, tell you what. And no matter where it would be, that would be my favorite. Because of in the guest book, if you put your name and your address and say, I'm the guy that wants the painting, I will send you a print of that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it, I mean, without, without the bird, it, you know, it has no life. 
It's just like kind of like a lifeless tree, but you know, it's right. Even mm -hmm. a tree without leaves, it still has a lot of life. And that bird right there on the bottom is this my one. absolute favorite. Yeah. He's, just, he's just sitting right yeah. there. It looks like that was right one. Of, that was one of the ones where I thought, I don't have. Hope I don't have to kill my baby. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted that bird yeah. to let to stay. No. There were a I few birds that had to go because of the composition, because there was like more birds on this side and it was with kitty wampus, it just didn't, you know, the balance was off. So, uh, but yeah, uh, Irving here got to stay. <laughs> I think it's pretty funny because you're like, uh, you know, it's like you have this event that's happening in the painting of all the birds and the mm -hmm. trees, and somehow you just flew into like this painting. Yeah, yeah. it was like, hey man, I'm just here waiting yeah. for a bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's on. He's about to fly out of the painting. Yeah. Yeah. Or he's looking off in the distance, like, something. "What are you looking at, dude? A pizza? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> what are y'all doing?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, is there a meeting? Yeah. Didn't uh, Didn't nobody tell me? Yes. So, how big is that canvas? Um, I have it written right on the label. <laughs> it is thirty-six by forty-eight. Yeah, and then how like. How long does it like take to complete like that work, and like how hard is it to actually complete the whole canvas? Well, um, this painting took two years, and um, and yet this painting took about four months. And you would think that there would be some type of formula answer, but there really isn't because I struggle with aspects of the composition. I may think it's going to be one thing, and then an accident will happen. And sometimes it's a happy accident, and sometimes it's an ugly accident. And so I gotta make a judgment call. And that's the thing about painting, is like you're constantly making judgment calls. Is this thing, do am I just gonna chuck this whole thing? Or is there a way I can solve this problem? And I think I'll never get Alzheimer's because I'm always problem solving, I'm always using the gray matter in these paintings. And, um, it, it, they really do present problems, and then when I solve a problem, I'm like, yes, I got it. And, and these are all obviously challenges I give myself, but uh, because the results are so pleasant for me, it keeps me motivated. And I think that gets back to why I have to make paintings that are interesting to me, and they're, for me, largely, there has to be humor involved, because I have to get a kick out of it. Because there's, if I'm doing two years on a painting, uh, now this one isn't particularly humorous, but there has to be something that, that holds my attention and keeps me motivated. I, I always thought that I couldn't do sustained things because I had kind of a short attention span, but it's because I never really found anything that interested me that much, and now I finally have. Don't you find that that's a typical kind of Thing that artists have. Yes, and in many cases, mm -hmm. it's like, what is your medium? Mm -hmm. I have a niece who's a surgeon, and she was going all through medical school, and every you do these rotations where for a while you're in um, orthopedics, and then you're in trauma, and then you're in maternity. And he, she kept going through all these rotations, and she said, have I made a terrible mistake? I don't really like anything. And then she did a rotation in surgery, and she just came alive. And, and she found her niche. And I think that's true with art. You, uh, you have to try everything. Um, like I was telling uh, your professor back there, I am um, a sad case at ceramics. I love mm -hmm. it. But I just can't manifest the correct behavior. <laughs> I can't <laughs> manifest the technique. And so um, I, have to, I have to love it from afar. But I've done watercolor. I've done graphics. I, I've done uh, digital painting. Um, I've done drawing. And, and the, this oil painting has just got a hook in me. I just love it. And it helps me stay motivated. Yes. So we have um, several first year, first semester, for third read into painting students here. We have some folks that are painting too. Do um, you have any advice for the first year students? Because they're in this place right now where it's, you know, what does this do? And how does it feel? And why do I need to do uh, fat over lean? And well, you know, when um, this kind of touches on about learning the rules, you have to learn the rules before you can break them. 
and most of people who are art um, student in freshman year in college, they probably were getting awards in high school, and they probably were used to kind of determining what they were going to paint or draw in high school. Now they come into a college, and the professor says, that's the still life, you're going to do it, and you're going to use charcoal. And you're saying, kill me now. A, I hate charcoal. B, that still life sucks. And, it's, you know, why, do you, why can't I do what I want to do? Well, the professor has carefully crafted a learning experience, so it will leave something with you. you it will deposit in you a skill that you didn't have before, and it will be part of an ongoing discipline. Studying is adopting a discipline. And learning a craft is adopting a discipline. And it isn't all uh, mountaintops. Sometimes you got to go through the valleys and you have to have these learning experiences that are very dry for you. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't bubble your core muscles at all. They don't make your heart go pity pat. They're just dry. And you kind of have to submit to it. And then when your skill base increases, then by your junior year, or some, in some cases your sophomore year, you get to make the determination. You get to submit a proposal for a project, and the professor will say, that looks good. Yeah, go ahead and do that. So it's just patience, I think. And that would be even... The saddest thing is if a person is really interested in art, and they encounter some of those uh, early classes, and they say, this isn't what I signed up for, and then they walk away. That's the sad part. Mm -hmm. Because then they never get to realize what would what was in them. So that's that's what I would say about that. One question specifically on your just your process of oil, like so when you first started. So I had been really starting out only with oil and liquid. Oh right? yeah, liquid. I was because, using liquid for a while. Yeah, because they have a, you know just a limited amount of time to work on each project. Right, that makes sense. What was the hard, what was the biggest learning curve that you had to overcome when you started oil painting? I was mixing too much oil paint, and oil paint is super expensive, and I was mixing up globs of it, and then class was over and I didn't bring anything to take it home in. And um, then also there is a, there's a certain kind of a, a thing you buy in a tube, that a, it's a paintbrush cleaner. It comes in a little beige tube, you can get it at Michael's or you can get it on Amazon. And you can get oil paint out of anything with that stuff. I was ruining so many articles of clothing with oil paint. And I discovered this stuff. And in fact, I will, um, I will text it to you so you can share it with the students. It's a godsend. It gets oil paint. I've even gotten oil paint out of carpeting with this product. It's, it's fabulous. But um, the thing that's neat about oil as opposed to acrylic is you can go back. You come back the next day and you can rework it. You know, say like you, you come back and you say, that didn't turn out as much as I hoped it would. And you can go back in, you can coat the surface with liquid, and then you can go back into it. And with acrylic, sometimes you just can't get that. I, um, when I was taking classes, I bought a little plastic case that, uh, that could cover my palette. And I bought paper palettes, and you know, you just put it in this little case and cap it up, throw it in the car, go back to class two days later, and you can, you still have your paint mixed. And uh, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Oh, yeah. I just yeah. was curious because I think that um, it's a challenge. Oil, as if you've never even painted anything before, I and mean, you're jumping right into oil. So there's just a lot of. Uh, upfront kind of learning curve that you yes. have. What will this on. paint do? Yeah. And, and uh, what won't it do? And like you said, fat over lean, lean over fat, whatever. It, that's, those are rules that you kind of have to adhere to. Um, I like it better than acrylic because you can get richer depths. You can do glazing. I'm just um, getting a, using glazing a little bit more and I really like it. I really like it. Um, and um, I'm also starting, like with the dog painting, I started drawing the dogs on the canvas, and then I, um, I painted them in grays, different shades of gray, and then I added glazes over it, and it made the painting process so much simpler. And it's, I think, the way Rembrandt painted, but I don't know the name of it. I kind of, my mind is, I think it's because I'm kind of excited right now because I'm standing in front of a bunch of strangers mm -hmm. and I kind of can't remember stuff. Mm -hmm. 
but there's a neat name for it. And um, well, what we're doing right now is we're, we're going to be starting on put, learning undercoating and yes. then drawing it out with the you know with the monochromatic color. Yeah, that's what I'm talking so, about. It makes it actually easier. It yeah, might it seem does. like um, it might seem like torture if you're used to just <clears throat> laying paint on, uh, but actually it makes it easier in the end. It's worth it. So, any other final questions as we wrap up here? Yes. Uh, what kind of framing do you have around your frames? I make my own frames. I just get lattice stripping. I paint it a real neutral gray. And I don't want the frame to take away from the painting. I don't want you to be saying, where did you get that frame? I just want you to look at the art. So, and it's cheaper because frames are super expensive. That's just like, I don't know any artist who can afford really frames. It's, it's just ridiculous. Do you get that at Home Depot? Or I get it at Home Depot or Lowe's. I buy it by the yard. Okay. And then I got a miter box at home. <clears throat> and I just, um, I miter them and, and then uh, nail them on with brads. And then I, I paint them. I measure them, tack them on. Then I take them back off and paint them and put them back on. You know, Heather was talking about the cheaper yeah, and it's cheaper, and I like it better because I don't think it competes with the artwork for your, the attention of your eye. Yes, you had mentioned that you were getting into glazing more. And, yes. And so, just as an, a mature artist who's already there, you know, um, when you're looking to acquire new skills or are new things that you want to try, do you? seek out other artists in your community or do you yes. kind of venture? I have a network of online? artists where we, we, will, we problem solve with each other and I found people that um, you know you have to find the right people, people that you can have trust with, people that won't say something dismissive or negative to you. The same criterion that you would use for a good friend if somebody's acting like a friend of me, you don't want to be open and transparent with them and be vulnerable with them. You want to make sure that you, you're talking to somebody who you can trust. And I have a circle of friends that, uh, in fact, most of them are your age or people that I went to school with just back in 2013 who are in their, right now, their early 20s, who um, we get together and we say, I'm having a problem with da-da-da. And we just kind of brainstorm and solve each other, help solve each other's problems. Have you tried such and such? And like one of them was telling me, I was getting dissatisfied with liquid. And she said, you should try linseed oil. And I've gone to linseed oil now and I like it so much better. It has a, a more of a sparkling quality to it. Liquid, I, I don't like the sheen you get with liquid anymore. I've just grown out of it, favor with that. But perfect for a classroom, so I'm not uh, disparaging liquid actually. And you find that you, you do do that, right? I mean, because yeah. you're just starting and you're... Or you find out, like, you know, the cheap version of sap green is just as good as the more expensive tubes. You can buy the student uh, tube of, of sap green and it, it works just as well. And, you know, like, inside stuff like that, it's just helpful. Also, YouTube videos are amazing. And then... Um, Sometimes I just go back and take classes. I, I feel like I'm a lifelong learner. I don't mind um, going back and, and having the professor say, okay, we're all going to paint gray circles today. Cross. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can deal with it because I figure you can learn something from everybody. And so I, it, it's worth it to me. I'm just highly motivated. Anybody else? These have been some good questions. In a very kind-hearted audience, yes. What's the harshest piece of criticism that you ever gotten, and how did you handle it? Um, well, I was about your age. I got accepted. I was an undergrad, but I got accepted in a grad summer program at Kent State University, where we had Philip Perlstein, Wayne Tebow, and the sculptor Frank Gallo as our studio critics, and it was the whole summer. And it was really, it was really amazing. And Wayne Tebow was at the height of his popularity at the time. He was very nice. He would sit and come and we would hire a model and he would sit next to us and draw with us. And I would be looking over at his drawing and seeing how he did it. And then Philip Perlstein is very well known. And he does these uh, very gray tone 
paintings of nudes. And he came into my studio and he asked me some questions and we talked. And he said, you're too well adjusted to ever make it as an artist. You know, he had this pronouncement, you know, I pronounce death. And uh, that just went right into the core of me and I thought, Philip Rosteen says I can never make it as an artist. And so uh, I switched my major, I became an art ed major. I said, I gotta be able to earn a living. And so I carried that with me for years. And then I thought, what the hey? I want to be an artist. And I just, in my mind, I fought back and I just pursued it anyway. And then when I went back to school in 2010, uh, I was I mentioning this to one of the professors. He said, oh yeah, back then, that was the, that was the approach with students. You just clobber them. And uh, he said, they don't do that anymore. And I'm so glad that I, um, I, I didn't, you know, it was kind of like a burr in my saddle. It, it just stuck with me and it made me feel inferior for many, many years. And the good thing is, as an art teacher, I made up my mind I was never going to do that kind of thing to a student. I was never going to discredit somebody and uh, just a sweeping remark like that and just kill somebody's dream. And I think it made me a better teacher. I'm sorry I had to experience that, but it did make me a better teacher. And I did eventually get past it anyway. And now I like my paintings better than Philip Rolstein's. <laughs> 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 How's that for nerve? <laughs> oh. So what do you think? How are we doing on time? Well, we're over this. this year. Okay. Well, this are there any more questions for Sheila? Yeah. Um, if you uh, want to friend me on Facebook, um, just um, friend me on Facebook <laughs> or grab one of my cards or email me if you ever have any questions or anything. And uh, it's just been a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Sheila's work is going to be here until Thursday if you want to come back for one more pass through before it's uh, the end of the show, unfortunately. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Thank you so no much. Problem. No problem.